Old Testament from Israel. All of them gathered together. They went to the open area in front of the water gate. They told Israel to bring out the book of the law of Moses. The Lord had given Israel the law so they would obey him. Israel was the teacher of the law. Israel the priest brought the law out to the whole community. It was the first day of the seventh month. The group was made up of men, women, and children old enough to understand what Israel was going to read. He read the law up to them from sunrise until noon. He did it as he faced the open area in front of the water gate. He read it to the men, the women, and the children of old enough to understand. And all the people paid careful attention as Israel was reading the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden stage. It had been built for it the occasion. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him. That's because he was standing above them. As he opened the book, the people stood up. Ezra praised the Lord. He is the great God. All the people lifted up their hands and said, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down. They turned their faces toward the crowd and worshipped the Lord. The Levites taught the law to the people. They remained standing while the Levites taught them. All these Levites read to the people parts of the book of the law of God. They made it clear to them. They told them what it meant. So the people understood what was being read. Nebai was the governor. Ezra was a priest and the teacher of the law. They spoke up, so did the Levites who were teaching the people. All these men said to the people, This day is set apart to honor the Lord your God. So, don't weep. Don't be sad. All the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy some good food and sweet drinks. Send some of it to people who don't have any. This day is holy to our Lord. So don't be sad. The joy of the Lord makes you strong. The Levites come all the people now. They said, be quiet. This is a holy day. So don't be sad. Then all the people went away to eat and drink. They shared their food with others. They celebrated with great joy. Now they understood the words they had heard. That's because everything had been explained to them. All the family leaders gathered around Israel the teacher. So did the priests and the Levites. All of them paid attention to the words of the law. It was the second day of the month. The Lord had given the law through Moses. He wanted the Israelites to obey. It is written there that they were supposed to leave books during the Feast of Booths. That feast was celebrated in the seventh month. They were also supposed to spread the message all through their towns and in Jerusalem. They were supposed to announce, go out into the central hill country, bring back some branches from olive and wild olive trees. Also bring some from myrtle, palm and shade trees. Use the branches to make booths. So the people went out and brought back some branches. They built themselves booths of their own roofs. They made them in their courtyards. They put them up in the courtyards of the house of God. They built them in the open area in front of the water gate. And they built them in the open area in the front of the gate of Ephraim. All the people who had returned from the land of Babylon made booths. They lived in them during the Feast of Booths. They hadn't celebrated the feast with so much joy for a long time. In fact, they had never celebrated it like that from the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day. So their joy was very great. They after the Israel read parts of the book of the Lord God to them, he read it out aloud from the first day to the last. 
They celebrated the Feast of Booths for seven days. On the eighth day, they gathered together. They followed the required rules for celebrating. New Testament uh, reading is from Acts, Acts chapter 18. Paul stayed in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed to Syria. Priscilla and Aquila went with him. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off and sent prayer. He did this because he had made a promise to God. They arrived at Ephesus. There Paul said goodbye to Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and talk with the Jews. The Jews asked him to spend more time with them, but he said no. As he left, he made them a promise. If God wants me to, he said, I will come back. Then he sailed from Ephesus. When he landed in Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem. There he greeted the church, and then went down to Antioch. Paul spent some time in Antioch, and then left and travelled all over Galatia and Phrygia. He gave strength to all the believers there. At that time, a Jew named Apollos came to Ephesus. He was an educated man from Alexandria. He knew the scriptures very well. Apollos had been taught the way of the Lord. He spoke with great power. He taught the truth about Jesus, but he only knew about John's baptism. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Priscilla and Aquila heard him, so they invited him to their home. There they gave him a better understanding of the ways of God. Apollo wanted to go to Achaia. The brothers and sisters agreed with him. They wrote to the believers there. They asked them to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who had become believers by God's grace. In public meetings, he argued strongly against the Jews who disagreed with him. He proved from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Thank you. This is the word of the Lord. We are Walmart and Rosemary Kowalski, and we're part of the ministry team here at IES. So once again, welcome to you, whether you're online or in person. You know, let's explain why our hall looks like this. Before we get into our talk and we explain why we use these scriptures, you remember what this is? This is round table Sunday, the last of the month, which means that we're going to ask you some questions. We want you to choose someone from your table to write down your answers and record it. We'll walk around later and we'll have you share with guys doing this. Because we believe that the Holy Spirit is resident in everybody who's a follower of Jesus Christ. So when you know when we gather as the body of Christ, it isn't the Holy Spirit up here teaching everybody who's sitting up there. It's the Holy Spirit working in everybody's heart. We want to hear from you what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. We want to learn together. And if you're at a table with just a couple people, when we start the question, move to a table with a few more people so you can have a good discussion, all right? Um, today we had some interesting readings. They seem kind of random. In one story from the Old Testament, we have Nehemiah and Ezra, which, by the way, for the Jewish scriptures, were one book. They've been divided into Ezra and Nehemiah, right? But it used to be one book that came right after the book of Esther, or before, or after Esther. I don't know. I should know. Anyway, same time period. The Jews have come back, and we see these different gifts being used by God. All right? People who could speak, people who can teach, the Levites who are in charge of worship, they're all working together. And that's what we're talking about today as we come to our New Testament reading. In the New Testament, who are the workers? Paul, oh, come on, you can do better than that. Paul, Priscilla, Aquila, 
olives, all right? All these guys and the family that makes the connections, all right? So, Waldemar and I joined a congregation of about 6,000 people for a while. We played the orchestra. Waldemar was a theological go-to, as you can imagine. And I trained women who led Bible studies. All right, but before I could do that, I had to spend a year under Margaret. If you have ever had an intentional mentor, you had a Margaret. She came every week ready for us, and we were always sure we were ready for her because God spoke so clearly. Every Monday, the Bible study leaders would meet. We'd examine what the scripture said and we'd share our lives. Well, Margaret was very intentional. She wouldn't let us tell anything bad about her husbands. You know, sometimes when women or men get together, they talk about their spouses. She would say, God knows the details. If you want us to pray for your husband, get out of the way and give God access to him. But we'll pray together. All right? If you have something going on with your neighbor, we're going to pray for your neighbor. We don't need the details. Margaret was very intentional. She said, no gossiping. If you want us to pray, God knows. Tell God the details and we'll pray together. Well, she made prayer cards for each of us. And some of us said, can we see your prayer cards? Because Margaret had promised to pray for us every single day. She says, you're mine for nine months. I promise you every day I will without fail. Pray for what's on there. And we said, can we see your prayer card? And she said, no. Between me and God. But she said, I'm praying for three things. I'm praying for what God tells me. I'm praying for what you tell me during the week. And I'm praying for what I see happening in your life. And I can tell you, she destroyed those cards after our nine months together. But whatever we learned on Monday that year, we taught on Tuesday to the groups of women. And then the second year, Margaret said, all right, that might be one of you is going to be the trainer. And God said, that will be you. And I'm like, oh, no, I'll never be Margaret. And I said to Margaret, oh, I don't think I can fill your shoes. And guess what Margaret said to me? Get your own shoes. <laughs> I'm taking my shoes with me. So you don't have to be anybody else. If you've had a great mentor, you don't have to be that person. You have to fill your own shoes. You know, she, I used to call Margaret sometimes, and you just go like, hey, help me with this. And she's going like, don't you hear from God? I've moved on. I mean, Margaret was intentional. She could also feel a little brutal. But we knew that we were loved. And you know, you, might be in a group under Margaret, or you might be Margaret for someone. Listen to what God is saying, and be mentored, and be a mentor. So, I wonder what it was like to catch the eye of not Margaret, but Paul. <laughs> After Paul becomes a disciple of Jesus, he spends a long time with Barnabas, and the two men went on missions trips together. Remember that the name Barnabas, that wasn't his original name. It was Joseph. But he was given the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. So he's a very encouraging guy. Paul. <laughs> I don't think I could have worked with young Paul. Uh, there's, he had to have been married to be a part of the Sanhedrin. At the time of his ministry, Paul was no longer married. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be Mrs. Paul? I don't think that would be a survivable thing, or even being a part of her calls. It would have been very difficult. You know, the older he gets, the more mellow he gets. God changes him. You've met people, the older they get, the more, eh, I don't want to be around that person. No, Paul, the older he got, the more like Jesus he became. I think that's really So you can see more and more the influence of Barnabas in the life of Paul. Becomes mellower, more kind hearted, more caring about the people that he serves. So Barnabas, who's not in the picture anymore, leaves a lasting impression. He is part of the life of Paul. 
So Barnabas mentored Paul. And in our reading today, Paul became a mentor to Aquila and Priscilla. Now, uh, you, when you're reading, notice the order of the names. Because it's Aquila and Priscilla whenever we talk about their house, their household. But whenever we talk about their ministry, it's Priscilla and Aquila. She is named first because apparently she was the lead in terms of ministry and teaching. And he takes them with him to plant and strengthen a church in Ephesus, trusts them with this young church. He knows that they will teach the faith, they will baptize believers, and then what does he do? He leaves. But they already learned a lot. When another leader, a guy named Apollos, comes along, they're ready to pass on what they learned from Paul to him. Rosemary talked about Margaret. My Margaret was my dad. <laughs> um, people ask me where I got my love for theology. It was the debates at the dinner table. So frustrating to my mom. Because we, and would, so, sister. we would hammer it out. And at the end, we always just say, oh, yeah, well, we are saying the same thing, just using different words. And then my dad would have me work with him. He, he was both a pastor, but he was also an architect, civil engineer in construction and stuff like that. And so I got to work with my dad. I watched how he lived and what he did. And that's why you could put shower heads on the house when you moved in. You know, you never know what your mentor teaches you. Very useful skills, Absolutely. including theology. Well, in Acts 18, it's not that Apollos is uneducated. It's not that he's not smart. It's not that he's not devout or religious. It's not that he's not following Jesus. But there are things that Apollos doesn't know yet. There were many things that Margaret taught me, even after I've been in ministry for years. And by the way, part of Roundtable Sunday is us learning from you. That's really important to us. We have people who mentor us here. We, we really, really miss Dr. Ann. Because she was a trusted guide, a trusted advisor to tell us what to do and not to do. Things like that. So, what happens with uh, Priscilla and Aquila? They listen, they invite Apollos to their house, they ask him questions. They find out what he knows and what he doesn't know yet. And they never say to him, well, you're nobody because we're farther along than you are in the faith. No way. They don't belittle him, they don't mock him, because no good mentor will ever do that. Uh, a mentor will always encourage him. Instead, they fill the blanks, they teach some more basics about Jesus and baptism, and they make Paul stronger. Then they send him off to work in another place. They make sure that he has connections with believers in Ohio, where he's going. And Apollos is on his way. He now goes to Ohio, and he is a strong teacher because the people who Paul mentored are mentoring him. Priscilla is teaching him, and I made a comment on this before, but let me just point it out again. Priscilla is named first whenever we mention their ministry. And um, that's, that's not a big deal. In, in, in the Pauline communities, if God empowered you, you were supposed to do what God empowered you to do. Not part of our notes, but Rosemary's PhD dissertation was on the early Pentecostal women who went out in ministry because the Holy Spirit had empowered them. And if you've been empowered by the Holy Spirit, I don't have the right to say to you, be quiet, because you don't measure up to my standard of what it should look like, right? When we first came, I remember a very tearful conversation in our leadership team meeting. And you guys might remember this. I asked, now, why are you tearing up? And this person said, I've never seen an Indonesian city in worship. And we said, why not? Well, there were always people who looked like us. There were lots of people like that. When the, ch when the church changed, God changed who we called. You might say, well, someone like this and this has always led, or someone like this has always been in front. How 
you all if God is calling you? Are you going to say no? Or, oh, I'm too scared. So I didn't have to do I don't want to. No, you better not. Just go like God. Just give me power for the next step. So in this story, we're coming to our first discussion point here. In our story, we have four stages of mentors. The first one was Barnabas to Paul. Then we had Paul to... It's on the screen, come on. You can, you can speak louder than that, okay? And then Aquila and Priscilla to... Good job. And then it was Apollos to the people of... Okay, yeah. good stuff. So for our first question, we want you to think about what makes a mentor, a good mentor or a good role model. Find someone to write down your answers and remember, whoever writes them down and speaks this time is not going to be the same person who does it next time. All right, so we'll have two different people. For this first question, You'll have five minutes. Then we're going to go around with the mic so you can give one of your answers. And we're running a little bit short on time, so one answer, okay? Not not a big long stream. Uh, so think of what each one of these mentors gave to the next person. What what was Barnabas's unique uh, gift? Paul, Priscilla, and Aquila, and Apollos. What made them useful to the people of God? So, again... Here is your question. Okay, we're going to put the mentors up again. But here's your question. What makes a person a good mentor, good spiritual, otherwise mentor, and a good role model? And when you hear this, it means it's time for us to hear from you. Uh, uh, quick mode, quickness, 
and the responsibility and the person for life. <laughs> A good mentor is one who reflects on their own testimony. A good mentor is someone that has a good relationship with God and other people. <coughs>
teaching grade two children, what do you need to know? You need to be ahead of them. If you're already in grade four, you can probably teach grade two children. It may be not quite that simple, but you don't need to be like way elevated to be able to be of help to God's work. So if you're in grade four, maybe you can help a grade two with their homework. Mm -hmm. All right, don't say I'm not good enough, I don't know enough, I'm not this, I'm not that. If God puts someone on your heart with that in mind, what might God ask you to do? So we're going to talk about practical questions, two practical questions around the table. And the first one is, what kind of a mentor do we need today, or do you need? And what could you offer someone as a mentor? So think of, we talked about character and, character and skills. What kind of a mentor do we need today? And what could you offer someone as a mentor? Talk about those things, just fully personal things about your own work, about where God has put you, and so on. Just talk to each other. And maybe get some ideas about mentorship. And we'll give you five minutes to do that. But